Good morning again. My name is Don Karatko. Uh, I am the uh, Jack M. Gill Chair of Entrepreneurship, a professor of entrepreneurship and also the executive director of the Johnson Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this, uh, this session where we're going to take a look at uh, stories of successful entrepreneurs in this uh, exchange that we're doing as a symposium between uh, here at Indiana University and, uh, and China. This is a, a tremendous opportunity for us to learn from some experts up here at the panel. I'm going to introduce briefly each member of the panel as we go along, and then uh, I'm going to ask each of the panel members to just give you a little brief overview of uh, a little deeper than what I'll say about what they do, and then I'm going to pose a few questions to them as we look at some of their successes, their failures, their challenges, and uh, if we have time, I'd like to open up to the audience for some questions at the end as well for the panel. So if you're thinking of some questions, keep them in mind, and I'll see if we can have a few minutes at the end before we break for lunch. We're, uh, since we're running behind a little bit, I'm going to move this along a little quicker so that we can stay on schedule because we do have uh, a speaker at lunch. We want to make sure that we're, we're staying on. Let me begin by uh, introducing the panel uh, from my right, moving along on the side here. The first is uh, Michael First. He is currently the managing director and CEO of Beijing-based New Garden Education Group, which invests in China's education sector, including schools for Chinese kids, and he's active in other parts of the Chinese education sector as well, and I'll let him fill in on some details in just one moment. Next to him is Vincent Mo. He is currently the chairman of the board and CEO of Su Fun Holdings Limited, a company he founded in 1999. And again, I'm going to let him give you a bit of the details of that. Sitting next to him, is Ling Lan Fang. He is the chairman of the board of Silk Road Group, one of China's leading silk manufacturers. It also has businesses in home decoration, clothing, and energy commodities. Sitting next to him is Jim Pearson. He is the founder, president, and CEO of NICO, an Indianapolis, Indiana medical device company focused on precision, minimally invasive biopsy and removal of intracranial skull-based and spine tissue. Uh, Jim has uh, let me know that this June they'll be uh, out raising $10 million. So if we have some investors uh, here at the table or out there, Jim wants you to know. And he'll be sharing a little bit more of his story in just a moment. Sitting next to Jim is Sandy Chow, a very successful entrepreneur who has done business in Vietnam, Taiwan, Hong Kong, mainland China, and the U.S. He is currently the managing director of Acorn Campus Ventures and the founder and managing partner of Summa Venture Capital. And sitting next to him is Wang Zhongming, who is the Executive Deputy Dean of the School of Management and Director of the Global Entrepreneurship Research Center at Zhejiang University. So that is our distinguished panel, just as a brief introduction of who we have in front of you today. To begin, I thought we would start by going along the panel, and uh, maybe as I was told this morning, we start from the middle and work out as a different way of going across. So maybe we should uh, reach into the middle and uh, begin with, um, well, uh, Ling Lang Fan. Ling, would you give us a little bit of the, uh, some of your um, success, some of your background, a little bit deeper than what I read, as far as what you're involved in? Yes, please. Jinjinda, Indiana Da Xue, Michel Makalubi Shotan. Jinjinda, Zhejiang Da Xue, Yang Wei Shotan. 各位学者专家，各位朋友们，各位来宾，上午好。Dear distinguished president of Macrobi of Indiana University and President Yang Wei from Zhejiang University, dear distinguished scholars and professors, and dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 我是一个工人，我不是。成功的商人也不是什么学者我非常荣幸的来到这里跟大家介绍我的成长列程这是我到美国第三次到美国来介绍我的这个人生的道路去年这个时候我在美国芝加哥大学也是探讨中美的商务关系 um, I'm only a worker, actually, a normal worker or staff in the factory. I'm not a very successful businessman. I would love to say, I would love to say I'm a beautiful, successful man um, or a scorners. 
But I would love to share with you my successful story in developing my career. It's my, this is my third time to visit the United States to share my stories in my life, about my life. Last, the, the same time of last year, I had been invited to Chicago, University of Chicago um, to attend a meeting about China-US business. 去年这个时候在芝加哥大学研讨的是中国核弄法真的是我们看到惊叹 Last year, when I was in University of Chicago, we talked about the, uh, the Chinese new labor law and the impact on Chinese business and China-US relations and about business globalization. But this year, we will talk about the financial crisis on the global economy. So what a change. Only one year, what a big change. 去年这个芝加哥 大学的新制度学派的创始人罗纳德·科斯，他之所以对我这样一个呃人感兴趣，因为我是中国的一个典型的一个实业工人做成了一个企业家，所以他对我很感兴趣。the last year, the reason I was invited by Professor Ronald Kurz because I was I'm a typical man who from who grew up from a um like little workers to become a uh, successful to become an entrepreneur. I was a little worker um, by a state owned company, but then I grew my career. I, I grew my career in Zhejiang Province and developed my in, developed my company into the leading and top textile or silk industry in China. 历史的巨人邓小平在三十年前提出中国要进行改革开放，他制定的富民政策给中国的创业者们提供了最大的创业自由度。中国从此开始蓬勃发展起来了。我是亿万的创业者之一。Um, our our ex chairman Deng Xiaoping, not chairman, I mean one of our uh, ex chair ex chairman chairman Deng Xiaoping, he has pro proposed the uh, open up and reform policy. Um, this kind of policy is trying to make a lot of people get wealthier. And also allow us a great freedom to develop our own career. I'm only one of the billions of creators. 在我们浙江，有各种各样的企业家，有农民企业家，有老师企业家，有官员企业家，也有像我这样的下岗企业家和在校学生的企业家。in our Zhejiang province, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, like entre farmer entrepreneurs, official entrepreneurs, the teachers entrepreneurs, and student entrepreneurs. I'm only one of the lead of worker entrepreneurs and student entrepreneurs. Ling, let me, uh, let me cut in right now. We want to come back to you with some of those stories. Sure. So we want to move on and get everybody's introduction first, then we want to come back to the deeper stories. Sure. Very good. Jim Pearson. Jim, would you give us a little background now on you? Sure. Um, I attended Indiana University, uh, enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, make it very brief. Uh, I've done uh, uh, several medical startup um, companies and enjoyed them. Uh, probably the best part is just building a team and, and bringing uh, technology uh, out that really changes lives. Um, last company we did was a breast biopsy company that we're the first company in the world to invent a device to do MRI-guided breast biopsy, which is the earliest stage at which a, a, a woman 
um, can detect breast cancer that's high risk, so meaning their, maybe their mom had passed from cancer or their sister, and we made a technology to do a biopsy where there wasn't a minimally invasive alternative. So it was a lot of fun, and, and we built the company here in Indianapolis, uh, raised about $19 million, and, and over seven years uh, created 250 jobs and then sold that company to um, Hologic for $280 million. And uh, I, I learned a lot from some very successful people on our board and, and within the company. And uh, then from there, um, about 16 months ago, we started Nico Corporation, which is a minimally invasive brain and spinal tumor removal company. And so we go down an endoscope or um, up people's nose to their spine to remove uh, intracranial uh, or spinal tumors through basically a little straw. And so, uh, again, another technology that's, that's fantastic. We've, we've raised about um, $2.8 million so far. We just launched the product um, actually two weeks ago, and, and uh, we just, my wife and I just had a baby two weeks ago, ironically, so it's like having twins. <laughs> And, uh, you know, hopefully what we can do here today is, is hear more questions uh, from you guys um, because I'm really not here to talk about the companies we did, but rather hopefully uh, create some dialogue with people in the audience about things that might be helpful. Um, I'll have time afterwards, too, and you can always look up uh, niconeuro.com uh, if you have questions for me directly, and hopefully we can be of some help as a panel. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Vincent, let me move to you. Um, very glad to be back to uh, Indiana University. Uh, 17 years ago, when I was a student, a second year PhD student <laughs> at uh, Bloomington, I started my first company, which is a uh, winery company, uh, together with a professor from the law school, Professor Oliver, and uh, a student mm -hmm. in my class. But that's, uh, that was a failure. I, I, uh, I uh, registered in Guilin, my hometown, and uh, within six months, it went out of business <laughs> because <laughs> I have to return back to school. <laughs> uh, and seven years later, in 1999, I funded my uh, current business, which is SoFun.com, and China's uh, uh, major uh, leading real estate internet company. Uh, SoFun.com is also the world's mostly visited real estate website. Um, SoFun, I think, after today, it is uh, we uh, have uh, had a very good return to its investors, and it has uh, now about 3,000 people working in uh, over 50 cities in China. And last year, 2008, it passed its 100 million U.S. dollar revenue. Uh, with uh, over 50 million revenue, 50 million US dollar uh, uh, net profit. So it is still growing, and we have uh, had uh, over 50% growth rate in the past four years continuously. So uh, we are uh, uh, getting into the next stage to be uh, working on everything home and internet in China. So that's the uh, basic information of SoFun.com. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, back over to Sandy. Okay, uh, basically, it's just the, uh, coming here, I just want to bring you a message uh, from, the, from Silicon Valley, which is I reside in, which I started uh, uh, my business, uh, the, the U.S. business career over there. And uh, uh, what I would like to stretch is just uh, we are really crossing uh, the border to, uh, all the way to the, uh, uh, in the old days, uh, when the U.S. say young men go west, and then the, uh, what happened is just the, uh, uh, it is the West that the, um, the old, what they call the Brick Four, that created the West and then everybody uh, kind of uh, uh, glorified the, the Big Four, the Crocker, the Huntington, which is you have the Huntington Library in, uh, in Southern California, the Mark Hopkins, and the, the Leland uh, Stanford, which uh, started the Stanford University. And these are the people that admire as the early entrepreneurs of the United States. And then the, uh, right now is uh, what we call young men or, or people of different age go further west. It goes so west that it becomes east. So, uh, but the, uh, but the, uh, let, let me tell you that the Silicon Valley people 
uh, actually somehow ignorant, sometimes uh, downright arrogant. Uh, they believe the sun rise from the west and set in the west. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have to go through a certain frontier. I came in uh, ye yesterday by way of Frontier Airlines. Uh, it's wonderful airlines uh, coming through Denver. And then the, uh, and, and later on, I turned on the, uh, the TV last night on, uh, in the room, and then Star Trek, and then the, uh, the last frontier. And I remember uh, when you're, uh, a few years ago, you go to China. They don't call immigration. They call something like border control, but it is uh, translated called frontier control. And then so therefore, basically, what we are talking about, we are crossing to the west, going through the frontier, and then probably the last most important frontier there is. So later on, I'm going to talk about my direct experience of entrepreneurs in the west, in the, uh, the Chinese American during the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Very good, thank you, Sandy. Mike, I'll come to you. Dajiahao. Uh, 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 what I just said is that I'm not from Indiana. I'm, I'm really from Beijing these days, but my, my, my home is really New York. Um, and to pick up with, from something that uh, Scott said this morning, um, Indianapolis is a very modern airport and is Many, many of you have heard New York also has a, I mean, uh, Beijing also has a very modern airport. New York, on the other hand, the airport that I flew in and out of, I think, dates from World War II, and it looks like it. And it, that may be a metaphor for today's world in, in many ways. Um, I'm, uh, uh, my, my background is, is that I've been in, in China for almost 18 years. Um, and in Beijing for 13 years, I was for six years, I, I held the same job that uh, Mike Barbalis has, and thank goodness he's doing it now and not me. Um, uh, after I did that, I, I became a professor and an associate dean at, uh, at uh, Peking University at Beida, um, where I was also a, um, a professor of entrepreneurship. And each year, um, as a sort of a special side project, we did a, a joint case between Boston College and Beida. One year, um, I chose my then girlfriend's company, um, which was uh, trying to get into the business of developing and managing Chinese schools. We developed a business plan, which uh, uh, was entered into a competition in Boston. And, uh, um, I don't think we won but uh, the competition, but that was less important than that we used the business plan to develop the company. Uh, the company now has, uh, has opened three schools in Beijing with probably another three open uh, before the end of this year, it looks like. We currently are operating one. Um, uh, I think that's, that's as much as you want from me at this point. That, that's fine, Mike. Okay. Thank you. And Wang. Zhong Ming, huh? <laughs> okay, good morning. Uh, I come from uh, Zhejiang University School of Management. Um, uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, um, we started the special link with uh, Indiana University, and now we have very close link with uh, Kelly School of Business. Uh, we receive um, students every year from Kelly to uh, have study abroad uh, program, and uh, this year we uh, uh, shared with their, uh, our experience with um, more for entrepreneurship in companies like Wahaha or, uh, or Wensley, the, the very famous silk company. And uh, we, we enjoyed being uh, collaborating with uh, uh, Kelly. And my school has uh, so-called two uh, focuses or two niche that niches we are uh, trying to develop. One is entrepreneurship. The other one is uh, innovation. and. Um, we have launched a few years ago the first uh, PhD program in entrepreneurship, and our institute, our national, we have a national institute of uh, innovation, and also the global entrepreneurship research center. Uh, and recently, we have been 
working uh, very uh, actively in studying how uh, Chinese industrial clusters could be upgraded or transformed into a more globally oriented um, or global uh, entrepreneurship companies. Uh, so I want to use this opportunity to share with you some of the progresses uh, later. Thank you, Zhongling. Thank you so much. Let me pose a first question to our panel, and that is that entrepreneurs, uh, it's often talked about, uh, they deal with the risk and they deal with the failures that come along with that in many cases and how they learn from failure. Would anyone on the panel like to give some insights on that? Maybe even be open and honest and share some failures and, and what they learned. I think that would be very beneficial for all of us. Mike? We've been screwed so much um, by partners that we didn't check out properly. Um, I said that we opened three schools. We only have one now that tells you something. Um, our partners have the other two schools. Um, as a result, we are uh, we're certainly a lot tougher than we were when we started. Um, we are extremely careful about who we do business with, not only in terms of, of direct partners, but um, also investors. There are some people, we, uh, we, we will not accept investors into our business, and, and our business is quite attractive because our margins are generally about 50%, um, without checking them out very carefully and being very carefully how we structure the, the uh, legal agreements. And we also have very, very good lawyers. And we've been to court a number of times, and we've won every time. What, uh, what have you learned from that, though? I mean, from the, these, these, these difficulties? We don't trust anybody. Okay. They have to, people have to, people There's have some to insight. Really, have to really prove their, you know, their, their trust in, in innumerable good. ways. No, that's uh, good. We've just completed a, um, a private placement, mm -hmm. um, which was, was, was less a matter of raising money, although that, that was certainly attractive to us, but because we wanted the talent from the investor group mm -hmm. um, that augmented and complemented some of the things that we had. Uh, but the, these are people that we've known for quite a long time, and we've, mm -hmm. as friends, we've been through a lot of things together, so um, it became acceptable. We, we had, uh, previously, we had investors from Taiwan who after six months decided they were, they wanted out because nothing had happened. And uh, uh, we, you know, we went through all kinds of sure. stuff with that that sure. it was uncomfortable. Very good. Thanks for sharing, Mike. Jim, you had a comment? Um, yeah, I want to make a comment because it's it's directly opposite just to give a, a wide variety on the panel. Um, actually, one of our philosophies is we, we try to trust everybody, which I know sounds naive given his experiences and, and certainly, uh, you know, in the environment. But what I mean by that is we don't blindly trust everybody. I mean, we qualify people. And, and what I tell people is when we set up the corporation, there are 10 percent of the people that are going to take advantage of you. There are 10% of the people that are going to, you know, as an employee, might cheat on their expense report, or, you know, as a customer, might try to get away with something, or mm -hmm. as an investor, might try to, you know, finagle the terms to their advantage. So on the high risk things, the most important things, raising the capital and those kind of things, obviously we have a tighter focus. But we always tell everybody, look, if 10% of the people are going to take advantage of you, you don't know who those 10% are. If you run around not trusting anyone, what happens in our world, which is different than his, and I know this totally different experiences, is we miss a lot of opportunities. And mm -hmm. so we tell our team, make sure that you're qualified on it. And if you're batting 90%, meaning 10% of the people take advantage of you, we like those odds. And mm -hmm. we take those odds. Again, it's probably Midwestern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's probably a little bit naive. It works for us, you know. But the point here is, there, in entrepreneurship, there isn't one right answer. And that, that's kind of my, my whole reason to want to comment. Is, is all things can work. It's got to work to what your model is, not to what someone else's model is, mm -hmm. you know? Because I'm sure he and others have valid points for the way they do things, and so do I. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the goal here is for all of us to learn some different um, avenues or, or approaches. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Sandy, comment? Yeah. Okay. Come to failure, um, I, I probably can't uh, keep talking for days. Uh, well, uh, in, in, in <laughs> <laughs> in view of limited time that I'll just uh, mention uh, maybe a couple. I think it's just uh, a lot of times, uh, I think uh, failure, failure a lot of times are good. Uh, if you learn something from it, uh, it's, uh, it just gets you uh, a better chance to succeed uh, better in the future. Uh, when I first started uh, a semiconductor company uh, in the late 70s, and then the, uh, a lot of times, uh, 
you're young and energetic and then uh, want to prove yourself, sometimes that becomes a fostering of failure. It's because you want to be elegant, you want to have a solution, you want to show the world you have the best solution for things. And then a lot of times uh, you lose the, uh, the objective uh, of certain things. So uh, what we would do is that we thought we we're going to have a very good technology and then uh, we say in the industry who have the best, uh, best thing and then we go after that and then try to build it up uh, with that and then we choose a uh, pretty tough uh, competitor and then that competitor is not yet uh, in microprocessor, they're in very high performance semiconductors, uh, the company called Intel. After we decided Intel is not the one to fight with, and then uh, you have to be back to reality. <laughs> so uh, back to reality is that then you really look at, okay, you have to size up yourself rather than you want to prove yourself. I think uh, in entrepreneurship it is. I think the aim is utilize the minimum effort try to make the maximum profit or to do the more, no matter whether it's elegant or not, whether people look up to you or not, it's not that important, but you do the job with the minimum resources that, have, that you have. A lot of times, resources are difficult to get by. So therefore, in such a case, a lot of times, you don't build something uh, because you know how to build something. You actually seek what people need and build just what people need instead of doing beyond. So I think it's, uh, I think, uh, it's easier than said and done because the reason why it is this. When you're picking on the wrong competitor, I mean the, uh, the agony you go through and then when are you going to come up with a strategy uh, to counter whatever necessary, the time you have to figure out where you come up with next dollar to, to pay rent and to pay payroll, those are, p are pretty painful experiences. So I think, uh, I think uh, entrepreneurs are uh, in some, some sort of such a way is that uh, they only look at opportunity, but at the same time, there are lots and lots of challenges. I think uh, the topic of, uh, of this uh, conference symposium is very, very appropriate. Uh, well, I can talk for days uh, <laughs> for a lot more, uh, more about my other failures, but anyway, <laughs> I'll share it. I'll get other people have a chance. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else on the panel want to give us insights on the failures and risks? Vincent, some thoughts? Yeah, we, uh, back to Michael's you know, comment, and uh, we're going to trust nobody. And, well, uh, I, I didn't say we don't <laughs> trust anybody. We're careful who we trust. Uh, we trust uh, everybody. And uh, if they go uh, with our rules of the game, so that's the, uh, that we have been doing. We, I think we need to open to the outside world, to our potential partners, whether they are investors or our business partners. Back to my uh, uh, start of the funding of SoFund.com. I think if I could or we could combine the good things of the US and China together, uh, these two greatest countries in the world, and definitely we can uh, do something great. Mm -hmm. And since then, we had uh, we have been opening, keep our heart open to the uh, outside partners. We had uh, three round of fundings uh, in SoFund's uh, uh, development, and first funding is with uh, Goldman Sachs and IDG Venture Capital. Uh, it is about five million U.S. dollar, and uh, that's in uh, early 2000. And in 2006. We had our second round of funding from a company called the Trader Classified Media from uh, Europe, from, from France. Mm -hmm. And John McBain was the founder of uh, chairman of that company. We didn't know him before, but we trusted his uh, judgment, and uh, he uh, actually uh, stick to our rules of the game. And the third funding is from uh, a uh, very uh, big Australian company called the Telstra, which is a uh, Fortune 500 company. Um, uh, okay, back to the French company, they invested in uh, 22.5 million US dollars into SoFund. And the third one is uh, 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 2006, August, uh, which is Terrestrial, Store, and which invested in uh, 254 million US dollars into our company, which, which was the biggest uh, investment in China that year. So uh, by cooperating with all of these partners worldwide, which uh, makes uh, 
our successful story, you know, possible. So that's my way mm -hmm. of uh, thinking uh, why we need to trust our partners. Mm -hmm. But and they have to stick to the rules we play within China, within the market in China. That's very, very important. So uh, if we, we cannot play purely uh, any investor's rules, because so far it's different. The company we create, the company we funded is different. And the market in China is also different. So we need adjustment to the local situations. So that's, what, that's the way we deal with our partners. Very good, very good. Other thoughts? Han Fang? I just want to, I just want to add that um, uh, in our study among um, uh, many uh, successful or, or failure stories, uh, we found developing trust in uh, leadership teams is most crucial. Uh, at the very beginning, people working from different culture might have their own cultural background, and I found that uh, the ones who want to develop something called the third culture is often more uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, successful. And for failure, mostly uh, the team trust becomes uh, really a reason for, for that. There's Thank lots you. of uh, cases around that. Thanks, Xiaomi. Lan Fang, please, some thoughts? Okay, so, you know, our topic today um, is U.S. Channel Business Corporations in the 21st century, and he found that he's the only person who can professionally, I mean, he practiced he speaks professional Chinese right now. <laughs> yeah, 刚才讲到了这个中美商务当中的很重要的是一个信任关系。我也相信我的这个我也特别的信任我的这个中文一定通过某种途径让大家能够知道我的本来意思。Okay, since we talk, and since other partners have talked about trust, so I, I also trust that my Chinese can spread, uh, can convey the same message. 其实信任问题在中美关系当中不仅仅是商务也有政治的文化的这个历来都是一个问题在商务方面特别严重这个美国特别啊有时候呃低估我们认为我们这个在补贴倾销知识产权这方面认为我们啊做的不够好是我们是
But now we have changed another strategy. We, instead of redu reduce the price to please American customers and you know make the government say like we sell the lower price, sell the lower price products to America. Uh, instead, right now we are trying to um, be innovative, you know, to develop to to develop the research to develop the research area, something like that, to um, improve our quality to meet your needs. 大家刚刚看到这个浙江大学的校长杨校长，呃，看到他给大家讲讲话的风采了吧？可前几天我刚刚把他手下的一个最先进的家纺。呃，这个纺织品的一个研发的一个公司，啊，收购了他百分之七十的股份。我们要提升自己企业的研发能力。Uh, just now, all of you have witnessed the President Yang Wei's, uh, you know, uh, personality, pers pers uh, wonderful personality and a speech. And just a few days ago, our company has per, uh, acquired seventy percent of one of the research, research, uh, research and development. Development facilities. 百分之七十不行的话，你就说一部分好了。Mike, did you have a comment? Mike, did you have a comment on this? 这个呃，我认为，呃，做企业、做商务、中美合作也好，第一个要求诚信，第二个要求和谐，第三个要求创新，这是我们做商人的最起码的道德伦理和道德本质。谢谢。嗯哼 ，I think as a as a key to the success as well as the Ethics of success, ethics of business should be it,、uh, integrity, harmony, and innovation. Very good, very good, Bang Fan. Mike, you had a comment back on the yeah, trust. Yeah, comment, and as it turns out, a, a follow-up. I, I, I think um, um, Mr. Ling's comment is exactly right. Um, to us,、uh, almost the the central factor for our business, and the reason we think that there's an opportunity has to do with integrity and trust. Um, one of the things that we we noticed when we looked around、uh, the market was that many of the schools that we compete with, many of the the private Chinese、um, schools,、um, would say a lot of things to their potential customers, to parents of children that were thinking about sending their kids there. But、uh, following them down the line, you find that this was a lot of marketing hype, and what they actually did was quite often something very different. So when we started our company, we said. We would be、uh, remarkable by our level of honesty and integrity. We would do exactly as we said we would do, and even if it costs us money,、um, the money would be secondary. That the, the service that we provide to families who send kids to us, that, that trust us with their kids, would be the the, the very first thing.、Um, after four years,、um, I don't think that our judgment about the market has changed at all. Um, our competitors continue to to look for growth and and size before they do quality, and、uh, that's quite a different business model than what we're following. Very good. We、uh, we hear so often that、uh, in in growing a business, the challenge is in finding the good talent, managing that talent, and growing it. Can some of you provide perspective on how you have found the good talent in your organization and managed that talent? Because that's always a challenge. Some thoughts, Sandy? Why don't you lead off on this one? I think、uh, I changed from the uh, uh, entrepreneur、uh, on the other side、uh, to the investment side. So therefore, I, I know exactly what、uh, I know the importance of、uh, of uh, investment uh, into entrepreneurs is. You have the best entrepreneur come to you. If all the bad entre entrepreneur come to you, you can. You can never deploy your your money the right way. So therefore, attracting the、uh, the entrepreneurs, there are quite a bit of、uh, challenges. And then the、uh, number one is us. I think、uh, today we'll be talking about trust. Is us they can trust that with you they can be successful. So how do you deserve that trust? Is that you have to. Show that your portfolio is successful. You have a track record of success. So the track success. Would attract success, and then even more so. What do you mean by success? A lot of times it's us. That I think the final final record is us. Everybody get a ton of money. So therefore, if they believe, I think the final goal is make a lot of money, and then you can help them there because you take care of them. 
I think that is the uh, uh, one thing. Another thing is this, that they say a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs they have only a limited spectrum of skill. That if you have a uh, kind of a very scalable and then have a lot of guidances and things like that and can develop the entrepreneurs in that way. So therefore, uh, they will believe in you, the trust is us that you can make them successful. I think in, it is the, uh, it's not easy to seek for the best talent there is. But somehow we are at a golden age in the United States right now. Especially, I think one area that one can be successful a successful starting business is to start some business that you have some U.S. element and mainly you must have some China element. That combination is very, very powerful and we have so much resource in the United States. Just a little while, while ago, uh, the, uh, President uh, McRobbie said, Indiana University has uh, 6,000 uh, foreign students 15% of them are Chinese, are coming from China. That's almost 1,000, 900 to 1,000 Chinese students going through here. Just like Winston just came to uh, Indiana and then to uh, create a company that making $50 million profit every year. These are the resources of, uh, of talent. Just looking into the Chinese Americans in the United States and through them as a bridge to China and this is exactly the U.S.-China cooperation means. So I think uh, it's very, very, very true. I think everybody should, should, uh, should grab that opportunity and go further west and then the further west become the east. That is China. So I think there are plenty, plenty of, things, uh, of talents we can grab from the Chinese who are already here and together with the Chinese in China. The tremendous amount of, of, of talents. I would say from Indiana, you have talents from the Indiana University alone that a lot of them are, have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. They, don't, they may look like they're not comfortable here. They don't talk very much. But on the other hand, when you unleash them in, 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 in China, all the power comes out. And also, I, I can also I believe uh, Zhe Jiangsen is the most entrepreneurial real uh, province in China, just in the university. I think among the students, tremendous amount of resources. So I think it's, uh, I, just coming here, I get so excited. So tremendous amount of opportunity and, and talents that you can harness almost immediately. So, and, and, that, and then also, the environment is correct. The China government encourages such a kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's no lack of, uh, of talents, I think is us. The important thing is us that we need some mechanism to put them together to awakening all those uh, dormant talents. I think when is those uh, power is unleashed, it will be uh, really, really very powerful. So uh, I, I I would say um, um, a lot of times. Uh, sometimes uh, I I make things simplistic. At one time, I was, uh, I was in Taiwan at one time. The, market, uh, the stock market is at 800. And then the, uh, somebody asked me, uh, is it a good time to buy stock? <coughs> I said the market has been depressed for uh, almost a decade. Of course, it's, uh, you can, uh, it's a good time to buy stock. He said, what stock to pick? I said, buy any stock. And then at that time, the real estate market is depressed. He said, is that a good time to buy real estate? I said, of course. He said, what type? I said, buy anything. So, and then he's like, oh, get out of here. Why? He said, you don't, don't, do, don't, you don't do any research whatsoever. How can you say that? But however, after that, within three years, within two years, the stock market uh, index from 800 to 10,000. And then the real estate market went up four about 300%, it's four times its original level. So at that time, when the timing is right, you just go ahead and do it. So right now, I certainly believe the opportunity of US and China cooperation is on the verge of really taking off 
it's very tremendously. So you ask me, I'll give you the same answer. Go ahead and do it. The future will be a five-fold, ten-fold, fifty-fold, a hundred-fold. Very good, Sandy. Mike, you had a comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I, and again, uh, our perspective is uh, from the point of view of we are a Chinese company. Um, we are Chinese-owned, although we have, we have uh, non-Chinese money that has invested in it. Um, when we hire people, we hire them whether we need it or not. When we find talent, within limits, of course, when we find talent, we hire them. Um, as a result, uh, for the size of our actual operations, uh, we're probably overstaffed. We try to be quite deliberate about that, but when we find talent, we'll hire it. We have more teachers than we need for the number of, of classrooms that we have, but that's okay because we also find that um, a lot, about a, maybe 40% of the people that we hire don't really fit into our company, and we can't really determine that until after they've been with us for a while. Um, we need to have people who can uh, take responsibility, who can think for themselves, who can be indiv individual, professional uh, actors in, in, in our organization. And because of the nature of the, the Chinese educational system, uh, we generally speaking <coughs> have to give our employees a lot of training after we hire them. Um, we have a, a very, very strong management team that's very well rounded both from a Chinese perspective and from a a Western perspective, and we try to use those talents and have backups for everybody within the organization. Jim, an American perspective from a U.S. company on the talent? Yeah, on attracting and keeping talent, um, th this really, I think, is probably the, the most germane question uh, in the entire meeting, at least from, from my vantage point. Um, very much uh, this is the heart and soul of the company, and what we do is Everyone on our management team, as well as everyone from the secretary to the person in charge of quality to whomever, interviews or converses with a potential hire. And, and the reason is I want the potential hire to understand that everybody's singing a consistent message. And secondly, I want those people that are in different positions in the company to understand how important they are to our overall success. Because when you think about entrepreneurship and you think about what, what's attractive, when you think about being an entrepreneur or being around entrepreneurism, what do you like? And what you like is that it's explosive, that it's fun, that it's dynamic, that it's growth oriented, that you're making something happen that didn't and wasn't there before. And so we have our whole team interview with each person. We try to send the same consistent message. And then when we hire them on board, what we try to hire is somebody that's got something to prove, somebody that, that hasn't been to the top yet and wants to get there. Because that drive and that desire and commitment, if, if you have a team that's focused on reward systems for that person and you've listened to them, some people are in it for the money. You know, Some people are in it for the professional growth. Some people are in it for the friendships and the differences they make in the medical community in our case. So there are a lot of reasons why people come on board. And if you can line up the incentives to meet what those rewards are that they need, what you'll find is you get a very dynamic company. You know, this last company we did, we only raised $19 million. And when we sold it, we had six of it in the bank. And so how did we do that on, on little money? We did that because what we did is we hired a lot of youth because youth was much more moldable or malleable. Um, they would run through brick walls when they didn't even know the walls were there and get to the other side. And we had a, a, a set of board of directors that had all the experience and the guidance. Uh, I was the youngest guy on the team with the least amount of experience running the company. So I immediately knew the key was to hire my, in my weaknesses, which was experience. And you know the old saying goes that age uh, plus experience equals wisdom. If you have that wisdom guiding your team and attracting talent, and then you can get the talent to overachieve and to grow their careers, what happens is, it's not that you just get people that have achieved and, and been rewarded. It's that you develop a foundation that no, no new person being hired is going to mess with the culture of your company because the people that have worked so hard to create it become so protective of it. And, and it's a really cool thing to watch as you develop a company. And one of the things I always tell people we're interviewing is we only hire A players. And I said, and ironically, everybody I've interviewed is always thinking they're an A player. And the truth is, it's just not true. 
Some people are C players, some people are B players, some people are A players, and we can develop people into new talent levels, but we can't take somebody that doesn't want to work, that doesn't want to prove it, that doesn't want to get to a new level and make them into a producer. So this to me is, a, is the most critical thing, is you have to meet the needs of every employee that's in there, and they're in different ways, and the only way you do that is spending time with them. And I'll kind of conclude with one point, the other thing is you can't have the management team having special rewards or, or, or setting the system up so that, you know, the first parking spot, you know who gets that? The first person that's there. You know, the person that gets rewarded is the person that it puts in the effort. And we try not to set it up to where, you know, the management team's flying in first class and everybody else is flying in coach. You know, everybody does the same thing because, you know, if you set it up that way, what you do is you stifle communication. People won't, won't come up to you and talk to you. Then when crisis occurs, they won't tell you what's going on because they don't have a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. They figure they're not going to be able to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a lot of points rolled into one, but to me, it's this is the most passionate and at the heart of entrepreneurism is people. Mm -hmm. Vincent, I think you had a comment on this. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, I, I agree with Jim's comment. Uh, talents really, uh, uh, really lies in the heart or the core of growing a, a, a company. Uh, actually, that's one of the reasons I'm here today, because I'm trying to find talents from Indiana University to join us in China. So we had an internship from uh, uh, students from, the, from IU uh, two years ago, and uh, I'm going to talk to students on Friday, and uh, I think I, I can attract some students from IU uh, to join SoFan System. So uh, anybody interested, please just uh, talk to me and uh, email me. It's just a Winston and Moe at SoFan.com <laughs> straight ahead. But, <laughs> I'm sorry, Very I'm getting out of it. But back to the talent issue, I need to add, um, uh, I think, you know, in general, we are in early stages of the startup. We, uh, we hire from outside more. And with the growth of the company, uh, and we, uh, we, uh, we, we promote or we raise people within the company. Uh, so far, now we have 3,000 people and the, most of the senior executives within SOFAN, we just promote them from, uh, from within SOFAN. But uh, eight years ago, we hired people uh, from outside more for senior positions. And within the company, we have a, uh, our own management school called uh, SOFAN Management School. All you know, executives, if they want to take, uh, before they, they, uh, they take positions, we are going to train them before they take the new uh, executive positions. So that's, uh, I think, with the growth of the company, more and more talents or executives will be from within the company rather than from mm -hmm. uh, outside. Very good. Zhang Ming, your comments on this, on the talent? Yeah, I think um, uh, three things need to be done in order to have uh, better talent for entrepreneurial firms. Uh, we try to uh, open up uh, widely the minus of entrepreneurship. Right now, in my university, 800 students from other schools like engineering, medicine, or, or, or even humanities are taking minors with us. So kind of uh, train students uh, into a technology plus entrepreneurship type of uh, new type of talents. Uh, also, I think many companies, they try, they emphasize a little bit too much on selection, recruitment, but neglected the development side uh, within. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's very important to have uh, some redesigning, the efforts to redesign the work system to have the, we call it a high performance system to fit these uh, talents. Very often Chinese young people, they have more higher, kind of higher expectation of what kind of jobs they kind of uh, want to be future leaders mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, very kind of glorious positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's always a great efforts need to be done in order to redesign the uh, process and the jobs, procedures, and to fit these people. On the other hand, also put them into a very much uh, hardworking projects. Very good. Yeah. Anfeng, do you have some comments on talent? Any
any complaints always develop from nothing to ha to to have nuts to have from have nuts to have from big to small from from weak to strong, and the tenants should grow. The tenants also should grow with the complaints. 中国和美国以及世界上都有很多很多的企业，非常优秀的企业。这些企业的成长都有有迹可循。可是，在这些优秀的企业的前后左右，也有其他的企业存在。为什么其他的企业没有做得像他们那么强大呢？ Um, whether in in China or in America, there are a lot of、uh, successful companies. And but all these kind of successful companies have their rule to be successful. Although、um, around their company, you know, there are other companies around their successful company, but they still can keep successful. Why is that? 那么人们经常讲差异化经营，你做长的，我做短的；你做红的，我做蓝的。差异化经营，在我来看来，最大的差异化是企业家的这个价值观的差异化。啊、uh, ，many people talk about the to 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 run the company in, in a different area. Like if you if you、uh, do business in in red, I will do business in black. This kind of things. But I think the the main difference operation should be main difference operation is. Lies in the value of entrepreneurs. 对待人才的态度就是企业家的根本的价值观的态度。所以，我们经常讲要在追求中感恩，在感恩中追求。Actually, the attitudes towards talent can reflect the basic value of businessman. We often say like we should um we should feel grateful in the pursuit of a success and. Uh, become more great,、uh, become more successful by being grateful. 每一个团队，每一个企业，每一个学校，甚至每一个国家，它之所以变得如此优秀和强大，它并不是靠自身，它除了自身的努力、自身的价值观在起作用以外，还有周边的所有的人都在对它进行帮助，所以它要进行感恩，在追求中感恩。However, every university, every country becomes so successful. On the one hand, because they are the basic values, something like that. But it's also because a lot of people are helping them, and they try to reward them, give back to people who help them. This American has a very successful investor, named Buffett. He is known in our country as the "Golden Rule." He has a saying called "In the Dark, we are afraid; in the Dark, we are afraid." In the Dark, we are afraid. Um, Warren Buffett is quite famous in China. Everybody knows.、Um, he he he's well known as the king of the stocks. And he has one word. Say, he has one word. Says, um, 在贪婪中，恐惧。Okay. 在恐惧中贪婪。Um, become scared. I mean, become terrifying in the greedy, and become greedy in the in the terrifying. <laughs> I don't know whether it's the original translation. I think fear and terror are not good attitudes. Chinese companies and American companies, ah, actually, he was talking about another issue. I think the good attitude should be in creating, in creating. Okay, actually, I think. Either terror or greedy is not a good quality for the businessman. I think as a businessman, we should have better and a positive attitudes towards the world, towards the business.、Uh, we should share in through our share in through our、um, career development. 我们老是要把企业要做大做强，做大做强为什么？说是要为了实现自己的梦想。也就是说，我们创业是为了实现梦想，单纯的创业要实现梦想，这个梦想是达不到的。Mm -hmm. uh, many people say like we should make our company bigger and stronger, but only with our own dream, you can our single dream, you cannot achieve that. 你就是在创业中间要拿出始自始至终在创业中要拿出一块来。跟周边的人、跟股东、跟社会、跟国家、跟员工一起分享，你这个企业才能做得很大，也做得很强。
we should in, in developing our business, we should take one part, one portion of our income or profit to share with our shareholders, with our staffs, with our society, so that our company can have probability to grow stronger and bigger. Chinese Okay, so um, both in the Oriental, or both in the Chinese traditional ethics or virtues, and American advanced technologies and philosophies, something like that, but it both strengthen the sharing with our staffs. This is the treasure of the of treasure of successful business. Thank you for those comments. We have. Um we have some uh, uh, minutes left before lunch, and I wanted to go to the audience, as I promised, to see if you have any questions out there. If you do ask, I'm going to repeat the questions so they can hear us on the webcast, because they, you don't have a microphone. But if you'll just stand with a, with a question, I'd be glad to repeat it. Yes? You're asking, you're asking about his project specifically? Got it. Right. So, so the question is about Vincent's delegation coming over here, correct? For so far. Um, yeah, this is, uh, we organized the first group of a property buyers group uh, from China to the U.S. about a month ago. Uh, it, it was, uh, you know, there were more than 500 people applied to participate in buying properties in the States. And the first group uh, came with uh, 20 plus people and made it successful. And the second group is seen uh, in process. And uh, hopefully we can organize about 10 groups of property buyers to the U.S. by properties. It has made so fun for the first time a global company <laughs> because it's, uh, it's broadcasted everywhere by CNN, by BBC, by ABC, all the news videos globally. Um, so uh, people are, uh, you know, from the US, they are talking about whether Chinese uh, come in to buy uh, properties like uh, Japanese did about uh, you know, 15, 15 years ago. Uh, uh, they are, uh, you know, the group went to uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Las Vegas, Boston, and New York. Uh, they had a serious talks during the process. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether they have uh, bought any property in the process because it's purely their private uh, uh, action. Uh, but for sure, these 20 plus people, they are very uh, keen to buy properties in the States because 70% of their time here uh, in the U.S. Uh, was spent on uh, looking at properties. So uh, they were very excited when they returned back to China. And, uh, but the, uh, the only thing which is unexpected is really the media coverage in the U.S. and globally. They are just chased by uh, Medias everywhere in the in the in, in, we, in, in each city they uh, they went to, and it uh, looks like they are just uh, celebrities in the in the states. So that's the case up to today. <laughs> Very good. Other question? Yes, sir. So your question is a follow-up on the on the real estate, as far as what the the paper is saying about it might be the about the asset bubble bursting in the next two years in China. Back to Vincent, uh, and then to Mike. Yeah, you. It's a it's a very recent report, right? On the uh, on a, uh, a report from uh, I think it's from Beijing uh, Academy of uh, Social Science. Uh, uh, my personal view. Um, uh, 
uh, about China's property market because actually I'm running, I'm the general secretary of uh, China Real Estate Association's uh, policy committee. Uh, 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 my personal judgment of China's property market, uh, it's like the US market now. I think China's market is really uh, at the bottom level, or if not, it's, uh, it's very close to the bottom level right now in China. Uh, I don't see in the uh, uh, future there is a big decline in the price of China's property. And uh, I, I, I don't agree, and next year the property price is going to decrease. Uh, but uh, my, uh, my projection for this year of China's property market is really I think the price is going to be there, or it's going to be down a little bit, not very far away. The transaction volume is going to be up, uh, you know, coming in the in the whole year. Mike, you would have follow on to that. Yeah, I I, I agree with. Uh, we we've also in our company has done some uh, real estate investing as well, um, and I certainly agree with Vincent um, in a macro sense. On a micro sense, particularly in Beijing and Shanghai, in certain uh, stratas of the market. There has already been a drop of 40 to 50 percent. Any other? Any other well, thoughts? It depends on the uh, specific <laughs> projects. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, in some cities, specific cities like Shenzhen, which uh, had uh, jumped, uh, you know, more than 300 percent in the past three years, it did, you know, uh, uh, the price did dip to about 40 percent the past year in the in, in the last two quarters of last year. But now it's, uh, but comparing to the, to the, uh, it's getting back to the normal price. Uh, but overall, in the whole nation, national level, uh, up to date, up to today, and uh, the price drop is less than 5% five, five you know, national level from the, from the top price level. Very good. Other question? Yes, in the back. So the question is, as far as how much you would put into the venture? Right. So based on Peter Drucker's comment, we're, we're asking this idea, how many or how much of the resources go into the, the venture? Very good. Well, in, in terms of financial resources, basically we put in everything that we had. Um, which meant that there wasn't much of a reserve when things uh, took, uh, took a hit. Um, on the other hand, when it, when it comes to human resources, um, we, we certainly have more than we need at, at this stage of our development. Um, and we're happy to hire more people as we find them. Um, we have to see some possibility of paying for them in the near term. I mean, we're, we're not going to hire resources that we will need in five years. If we have resources that we can, we can utilize in the next year, we'll do it. Um, the nature of our business is, is that uh, we're, we're, we lease government buildings, government-owned buildings. Um, and on the one hand, we're a real estate business because finding and securing those locations is extremely competitive and uh, it has about a two to a three year lead time. Uh, from the you know from before the uh, the hole is dug to uh, completion and going through all of the the government uh, uh, bureaucracy to secure the building and sign a lease and so on. On the other hand, we're an educational company. We we develop schools and we hire teachers and so on. Um, if we see a property that's coming along um, in the pipeline and we think we'll be able to secure it for our purposes, we very we're very likely to hire teachers and, and principals that uh, we can't put to work in those schools yet because we don't have them. So maybe that answers your question. Anyone else on the panel? Sandy? Uh, I, I view the question is basically is this, uh, uh, 
it's it's uh, it's a lot more to it. It's be because reason why is just the uh, is how are you going to allocate the resources in different challenges? How much you want to put in one area? That that means resources will be limited. So what, how much talent you want to put in one area? That means you are sacrificing talents in other area. How much uh, monetary asset you want to put in the area is, it, is how do you allocate? I think the, the, the essence is really the allocation and then be not wasteful. So therefore, I think it's, it's the importance is this, what, is the, what are the priorities that you're setting that is most important for your success? Whether it is that you have to come up with a product that uh, you want to prove the concept is correct, and then the, uh, that you have to put the maximum effort to it, or is it the market that follows it? Or is it there's so many competitors around that you have to have cert certain preemptive uh, actions, uh, so therefore uh, you will not uh, left behind because everybody is out running. So it's the uh, it's really a matter of how to allocate, and then the. Uh, one thing uh, as an entrepreneur and also in business is that you never refuse resources and money. You get as much as you can. And a lot of times, uh, I think it's just uh, we, uh, in Silicon Valley in the early days, uh, I think Sandra Kursik of uh, Ask Computer Systems uh, uh, before the PC period, uh, really famous, and then she said, M money is more, more important than your mother. <laughs> so, uh, so it is. If you have money, put in in good use. Do not waste it. But anyway, put as much resources in anything so you can totally have market domination and very deep penetration. So therefore, it will be very very difficult uh, for people to uh, to compete against uh, against you. And it is good because the reason why is that for people are very difficult to compete against you because you're already efficient. And then I think this society is totally talking about productivity. And then you come on, coming with a solution that's most efficient. So I, I, I believe uh, so, so far uh, is doing is this, that they're, they're enjoying the present situation is that the competitor is way, way behind. So this is what I said is this, how to do that. You, you raise $5 million, you raise $22.5 and million, and then you raise $240 million. And then this is, uh, do not refuse a lot of money, e even when you're successful. So I think it's a total dominant situation and go, uh, and go global. So I think it's just, uh, in, in my opinion, it's just entrepreneurship is a wonderful thing. You can dream, and you can dream big. James, yeah. And then if the reality come in big, don't refuse it and go ahead for it. Jim, you've got a final word. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would take it from a little bit of a different vantage point from the entrepreneur's uh, vantage point. And, and certainly, we, we need venture capitalists. You know, we need uh, people with money. Um, you know, but I, I would take it from a little different slant. I don't want anybody throwing stones at me. But I, I really pretend I'm just talking to the people that create the business. If I said, I'll give you $2 million and you give me $50 million, is, is there anybody in here that I could give $2 million, you give me $50 million back? I don't think I'd find any takers. And what you also have to look at is when you drive downtown next time, you go into a big city, look at every building. And who owns those buildings? Banks, lawyers, insurance companies, right? All for good reason, right? But why do they? Because they set the terms of those agreements, right? And people say, hey, listen, you uh, let me set the terms. I'll invest in anything. And so what you have to remember as an entrepreneur, when you're creating the value, I differ from what he says. I take less money early, and here's why. Because I know I'm gonna put the points on the board. And you have to think that as an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you what, the people with the money will show up every time you focus on the near-term objective. If you focus on the near-term objective with an eye on the long-term strategy, and you hit these momentum builders and you start to develop what we call organizational momentum, you will get money every time. What happens is when the people, and again, I, I'm, I'm talking to the audience versus trying to make friends, 
what happens when the money shows up and people want to give you more and more money and they tell you to take more and more money, you got to understand what you're trading. You're trading hard work, you're trading sweat, you're trading equity at the least valuable time. My company's worth $1 million, let's say, and you're going to give me 5 million bucks for 50% of my company. And, I, and people get happy about this. Can you believe we raised $5 million? I think, oh my God, I just charged $5 million on my credit card. Could you imagine that? They don't want 20%, they want 500%. And you've got to know as an entrepreneur, your best currency early is your ownership percentage. That's what gets traded early. The problem with entrepreneurs early is they're on a different mindset. What they're looking for is validation, a pat on the back, a your idea is worth something. And what happens at that exchange point is the people that have give and the people that are looking for pats on the back get their pat on the back. And they find out five years later, they got $2 million for the price of 50. I'm not saying there's not value in it. I'm just saying as an entrepreneur, Step back for a second. It's like fog clearing in front of you. You can't see past the fog, but if you do those early milestones and the fog clears as you go, don't trade all your equity early. Get a team on that's seasoned. Get a venture capital on that's seasoned. Take a little bit of money, hit a milestone, let your valuation go up. Take a little bit of money, hit a milestone, let your valuation go up. Pretty soon, everybody wants to invest in. Then what happens, and this is where you need the VC, you'll get the top tier VC then. When they see you can do what you say you're gonna do, they'll want to get in. And the, and the bigger ones and the stronger ones, just like with entrepreneurs, the, the, the strongest will survive. The best VC will come find that company. And you'll want them for different reasons then, and they're all the reasons that aren't money. They're all the things that a VC can do for you that isn't money. There are a lot of people with money. There are a few VCs that have the Rolodex, the talent, the market knowledge, those are the people you want as an entrepreneur. So don't get fooled early. People say, I need money, and I always say, what kind of money? Well, I need the green kind. That's, no, that's not what I mean. There are different types of money. Make sure you don't trade in all your hard work early because you're getting validation, okay? Mike, final comment before you go to lunch? I, I couldn't agree more. You know, it, we're in a business that's very low risk once we get past the initial, initial stages. We have 50% uh, margins. We don't really need venture capitalists, except at, in certain very narrow circumstances. Um, if we take more money than we need, we give away a piece of the business. That means later on, when we're really rolling, printing the money out, we have to share that. We'd rather not do that. I think Jim is absolutely right. Take it when you need it. Take only as much as you need. Or as one of my, my former bosses in my banking days said, uh, uh, from a banker's perspective, only, always give people enough money to get, uh, to get all the way across the desert. <clears throat> In other words, give companies what they need. From a company standpoint, only take what you need, not what somebody offers. Great. We will leave it there as always. There's never enough time when you have such a great panel. Would you all join me in thanking this wonderful panel? <laughs>